The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to DIS2. Today, um, we're going to start talking about the reference window system model that I uh, mentioned in the class overview. Before we do, um, a closing thought on the design space of input devices that we talked about last week. Um, uh, this is Stu Cart, the, the guy who um, not only was involved in the uh, CMN model that you know from BS1, but also was one of the authors of the design space paper that we talked about last week. And, and here's a quote from him in a much later work that, that was kind of looking back at, at um, seminal HCI research, an excellent book by Bill Mogridge called Designing Interactions. Um, and in this, this he, uh, Stu Cart was asked about the design space paper and what he thought about it. And he said, this is most my ideal model of how the supporting science could work. It required good designers to actually do design, but what we could do, he means like himself and others as researchers, as HCI researchers, was help structure the design space so that the movement through that design space was much more rapid. The science didn't design the mouse, but it provided the constraints to do it. Um, and so that's, I think that's an interesting um, way of you know, understanding what the original author himself thought, um, how this design space was meant to work in the field of, of HCI research and practice. With that, on to the window system architecture. Uh, before we talk about the reference model, I wanna give a brief overview of what we generally expect of a window system, what we mean by a window system. Um, um, and a window system, uh, has, basically speaking, if you take a, a bare bones operating system, let's say, you know, you boot up your Linux laptop and you don't start any graphical environment on it, right? You literally leave it at like the terminal stage and a lot is missing, right? Um, and what a Windows system does is basically put the entire graphical UI in place that is, you know, makes the whole system available for use with, you know, the mouse, you know, moving windows on, uh, around, uh, switching applications, et cetera. So it has to handle input and, and that's a non-trivial task, right? I click your mouse somewhere, uh, I, I click on my mouse button and somehow that event needs to travel through and, and be associated with the right application that happens to have a window at that point on the screen. And maybe there are multiple windows at that location. So I need to decide which one uh, is the foremost one that needs to be receiving that, um, that click, and then I need to find out, okay, what application actually belongs to this window to. So it's a tricky business, right? Um, the second thing that the window system needs to do on the output side is basically um, applications should have the feeling that they run in you know, a safe environment that provides them with everything, right? An application doesn't want to think about, ooh, can I draw in this corner of my window because maybe there is another window from another application overlapping it. No, it should just you know, do its thing. And the window system, some layer inside the window system needs to take care of the fact that, you know, maybe if it's trying to draw something, that part can't be drawn because that part of the window is actually hidden by something else that is in front and that cannot be destroyed on the screen. So it needs to handle this output. Uh, and then finally, um, if you have a window system running on, on your desktop, and we're, for, for the moment, let's, let's think about the desktop environment because that's where the window system is most obviously in place. It also exists on mobile, um, uh, but we're gonna talk about that later, how it you know, sort of exists there. And, and the window management is the third thing, right? Uh, put a menu bar in place, uh, uh, define the look of that menu bar and, and the controls around windows, right? You know, how do I click to, to close, resize, you know, move a window around? You know that this looks very different on Windows, Mac OS, you know, various Linux, um, graphical user interface environments. And, and so that's part of what the window system also defines. Sort of the, as we like to say, the look and feel of how it, what it is to, to work with an entire operating system with a computer that, you know, that has lots of applications installed. So we have a couple of requirements, basic ones that, that we uh, can reasonably ask of a window system, right? First of all, we wanna obviously abstract away from the hardware, right? We shouldn't have to, um, you know, completely you know, the, the application shouldn't have to deal with, oh, there's another hardware installed. Now, now I need to do something completely different. That should be hidden. Um, and not just the operating system hides that, but also the window system does part of this. 
And then we want ideally to even abstract away from the bare bones of the operating system, right? If I can design a Windows system and then some Windows systems have been designed that way so that I can write against the APIs of the Windows system, I can actually flip out the underlying operating system and the Windows system takes care of hiding that um, and abstracting away from those details. Um, so in a way you could say that the Windows system as a very first stab at it tends to sit on top of the bare bones operating system. We'll see how exactly various existing systems actually integrated the Windows system with other parts of the OS, um, but that's a good um, abstract way of thinking about it. Well, then we want it to be fast, right? Uh, it has to not provide any noticeable delays for things like moving the window around or redrawing the cursor, right? That has to happen instantaneously. Remember the um, basic human deadlines from DIS1, right? Bloch's law and all that kind of stuff, the 100 millisecond deadline. Uh, that's true for you know, distinct events like clicking a button. But if I move a mouse across the screen, the 100 milliseconds is actually way too slow. Why? Because any delay that I start introducing will lead to sort of you know, the mouse lagging behind the position that I expect it to be at. Where you notice this most is actually on a touch screen. When you put your finger down, and the touch screen makes the interface makes the mistake of trying to put the cursor under your finger. You see every millisecond of delay because the cursor will always kind of be just behind your finger, right? When you move it fast enough. And so we need to be fast. Um, we certainly don't want our mouse, you know, cursor to stutter or anything like this. Well, then we uh, want the Windows system to enable a certain customization, right? Um, people may have different visual needs. Uh, they may have a color. Um, you know, weakness in their in their uh, ability of seeing, um, and and you know, or they might just have a personal preference, or they're in a dark room, they want a different switch. You know, so it has to be able to let us adjust that as end users. Um, it needs to handle input and output of multiple applications running in parallel. Obviously, right? Um, you don't want a single application to hog your entire system. And we'll see that this actually is true even on, on mobile devices, where we tend to think that we only have one app running at a time. But in reality, more is going on, and, and this parallelism still exists. Well, and then while early Windows systems, as you know from DIS1, popped up in you know as early as the 70s uh, and 80s uh, with the Alto and Star from Xerox, uh, we quickly saw you know, the addition of um, you know, advanced graphics output, 3D graphics, audio, uh, input and output and all these kinds of things that needed to be supported. Um, and similarly, uh, with the advent of new input devices, um, Windows systems needed to adapt to that as well. Right? For example, today, every laptop has a touchpad, right? Um, that you know wasn't always the case. And, and when you had a desktop environment and laptops weren't common, you know, touchpads were not a thing. So uh, those new input devices that tend to prop up over, over time needed to be handled also by the Windows system. Some of it, of course, is then already routed uh, or rooted in the OS uh, and provided to the Windows system, but it still needs to understand what that new device is and needs to handle its input somehow. So let's assume we're looking one year ahead, two years ahead, you know, depending on where you are in your studies, and you're now, you've been hired by a company, and a company says, okay, we want to, um, you know, we have, I don't know, a... Uh, um, a factory floor, and we need to put a uh, a system in place where you know the the operators of these machines can walk over in between their their shifts and and do a couple graphical operations like you know log in their time or uh, something like this. So they need a they need a graphical UI in place there. So you get to choose complete freedom. You know you're not. It doesn't say it has to be running on macOS or Windows or whatever. You got complete freedom. So you get to choose which, um, you know, which platform you build on. And, and the Windows system today is a huge part of that platform, right? Today, we could say um, writing for the, um, the Windows system that runs on, uh, on a Windows computer is quite different from writing for the one that's on running on a Mac. Um, and so we can look at evaluation criteria. We can ask ourselves, well, what would I look for in a good Windows system? What are qualities that a good Windows system should have? And we will actually apply some of these evaluation criteria later to the actual systems that we, we look at over time. Well, the first thing is, of course, 
if I can find a window system that is actually supported by a lot of different platforms, then that takes tends to make it easier uh, to distribute, you know, the the apps running on it, right? Um, so that will, you know, a cross-platform window system um, tends to be easier to um, you know, distribute apps for. Uh, on the other hand, a huge factor, of course, is you guys, once you're done with your studies, you're going to be expensive. I don't know whether you know this, but, you know, software developers are really expensive to hire, uh, especially when they're around for some time. Um, it may not feel like it when you get your first job offers here in Aachen because we have too many computer scientists right here in the city. But um, in general, you know, software engineering uh, is an expensive um, uh, time. So uh, we want these window systems to be very productive so that they make uh, the job of the application developer as efficient as possible. Then, of course, they need to cover um, parallelism. Um, they need to enable uh, several applications um, that actually, um, you know, can I can switch between. So I want to be able to switch between, um, I don't know, my browser and my mail client on, 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 a, on a computer, of course. Um, that's a given. But actually, also, we need to look at internal parallelism. Can these systems actually run multiple applications in parallel? Um, or is it just basically completely sleeping one application when the other one comes into the foreground as being worked with? So especially on weaker platforms, microcontrollers, embedded systems, uh, where we also often today see graphical user interfaces and even see things that you could call a window system, uh, this is often just not possible because the, you know, the CPU isn't powerful enough to do this. Um, <clears throat> then we have um, general questions of performance, right? Um, the basic operations that you know on, on main resources like drawing a window or or redrawing the screen or or network access or stuff like this, of course, needs to be um, very efficient, and uh, the latency needs to be um, brought down as well. It's actually interesting if you run a simple application like a, a simple uh, let's say office application on a modern computer, and you you look at what where the cycles are going of that, you know, of that uh, of your computer spending its time, up to ninety percent of the processing power of modern computers is going into the UI. Um, so you pick the right, you know, classes DS one, DS two. We take most of the cycles on the CPUs, right? We we keep them busy, right? So the UI is a very you know compute intensive task these days, especially with things like alpha blending and transparency effects and whatnot, and your windows slurping down to the menu bar or whatever they do. A lot of the eye candy that we tend to think of is actually there to provide a smooth, continuous user experience and make your job um, easier as a user um, at that computer. But then we have a couple things that we can look at. Um, most early window systems, I would say all early window systems use the raster model for the graphics. So they literally said, okay, I got a bitmap display, I got a pixel, I got you know some storage and I can put pixels there and I'm every application will have to render its stuff in pixels right um, that's a problem because if I buy a bigger screen and I want something to be you know five inches long how am I going to do that right if the application can only render pixels so that's why systems have over time moved to a vector based drawing format which is much more expensive computationally but it means that applications don't need to worry about the actual pixel resolution on the screen and how big a pixel is. They can just draw in actual, you know, measurements like centimeters, millimeters, inches. Uh, and then finally, the uh, one of the evaluation criteria will also be, um, is the look and feel uh, matching the tasks that people need to do with, with this uh, application that I'm thinking of writing? Um, is it maybe even exchangeable? Can I exchange the look and feel? Can I make my Windows users feel at home because it looks like Windows? Can I make my Mac users feel at home because it looks like a Mac? We have a couple more things though. Uh, if you look at, um, you know, if you are a, a developer on the Windows system and you're writing things that go beyond the basic, you know, standard GUI application um, that uses just standard components, you might want to start extending the Windows system. You might want to tweak it. Maybe you need to do something to it. Maybe you're writing it for this office floor, for, for this factory floor I was talking about. And maybe that factory floor has a weird non-standard input device. Maybe they're using some kind of light pen that nobody else is using these days. Um, and you need to somehow get that, you know, supported by your, by your app. Um, does the Windows system provide support for these kinds of things? 
Uh, and there's two ways that you can extend the Windows system. You could extend it literally in, in source code by you know, hacking the source. But if you change the source of your Windows system, uh, then of course, apps that you write for it are gonna be incompatible with anybody else's um, installation of that system. Um, or can you extend the Windows system at runtime? Can you basically teach it new tricks while it's running? We'll see some examples of that. Um, how much can I adapt um, especially at runtime. Can I, for example, um, start an application and then when the user decides to switch to dark mode, you know, because it's getting dark outside and he wants to switch it, can I tell all the running apps to switch their look and feel while they are running into a different color scheme? Is that possible, right? Does the Windows system support that or not? Similarly, for localization, do I need to reboot my computer to switch to a different language or is that something I can just do on the fly? Um, Next up, uh, resource sharing. Uh, this has become a little bit less of an issue because memory these days is not expensive anymore. Um, and we usually, we tend to have plenty of it, but uh, resources means things like fonts. It doesn't really make sense if every application would load their own version of the same font that we are using across many, many apps, right? That's a read only resource. I'm not gonna change anything inside a font. So we should only have one instance of that lying around in the, in the system. Um, to save space and to avoid inconsistencies through different versions and stuff like that. Um, next up, some, app, uh, some Windows systems can actually be distributed. Now, this is going to feel very strange. We're going to see an example of that in the X Windows system that we're going to look at first after our reference model. Uh, and that system actually allows you to do something pretty neat. You can run an application on one computer, but the application is rendering its entire UI and getting its entire U input and output on another computer. And that's what we mean by a distribution of the, the Windows system. Um, the API, um, the application programming interface that the Windows system provides, that's gonna be interesting to you as an app developer too, because that is the, you know, that's, that's the frameworks and libraries and, and, and stuff that you need to work with. And, and if these are, uh, for example, they can be object oriented, which most of them, and them are these days, or they could still be procedural if it's, especially if it's a low powered platform and it cannot afford the overhead of object oriented computing, which is always, you know, it's always a couple more pointer um, operations for, for every single thing you do. Um, you know, it could be procedural, but if it is, then that means that you need to wrap your head around you know, programming differently from, from an object oriented approach. Um, and that can have an impact on your, on your, um, uh, productivity. Similarly, uh, the API can just be more or less comfortable, right? You know, some systems are really well documented. They have great frameworks that are easy to use, good tutorial material, etc. And others don't. Um, then, what we're hoping for is that um, if I write an application for a Windows system. Um, that I can sort of focus the, the, the window system specific things in a fairly small part, and that I may even be able to move my application over to a different window system. So being, being able to write code that only has fairly thin API uh, interfaces to the window system rather than being deeply ingrained in it um, could be useful if you want to move your app, let's say from you know, Windows to Mac OS, for example. Um, and, and finally, of course, you know, copy paste, drag and drop, these, these, these things that we know from um, uh, our desktop and, and laptop environments, uh, and we just take them for granted. But think about what needs to happen, right? You're, let's say you're an application developer, you write your app, your app is happily running, and all of a sudden, you know, from out of nowhere comes a request says, somebody just pasted, you know, a, I don't know, 200 kilobyte JPEG into this window of yours. What are you going to do with it, right? Uh, the, the Windows system should support these things um, and should even in, you know, support things like drag and drop. And you know that even today, you know, sometimes we still run into things where that doesn't work. Now, um, question regarding yeah. the fonts in the chat, uh, whether they yeah. are managed globally by the operating system or uh, instead of, uh, yeah, that each application have its own font set. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so you're right. It's a, that's a good uh, remark, Charlie. Um, 
yes and that's when we when we today say operating system we tend to mean the operating system the bare bones operating system and the windows system on top of it as a whole right um that didn't always used to be the case if you look back at the times of windows you know you could be running all kinds of different unixes beneath and x x windows was running literally on top of that right um but uh you're right. The, the role of the Windows system is this resource sharing, right? And one of the things that the Windows system should be doing um, is to say, hey, if any app wants, you know, a Helvetica 12-point font, I got this right here. I'll, let me give you a pointer to that. Um, and then if the next app comes around, it gets the pointer to the exact same data structure in memory. Right? So that means that, yes, uh, not every application needs to load its own fonts, hopefully, um, and you sometimes still actually see these things break when you, for example, run, uh, let's say you run an X server on a, on a normal modern machine, you install an X on top of, let's say, Windows or Mac OS, and then you run an application inside X, then you suddenly see, oh, this app needs a font, but that font needs to be provided by X, and, and my native system doesn't have that, and then you get into these, these troubles. But you're right. Um, we want uh, resources to be shared, and fonts are a good example because they're usually read-only um, but we will see that other resources are much, much trickier to share. For example, all apps running on a computer need to share the same mouse, right? <laughs> um, but at the same time, every app shouldn't have to worry about that. I don't want to think about whether an event is meant for myself or somebody else. If I get an event, I want to assume that it's for me, right? Um, so that's going to be a big role. That's one of the key roles, actually, of the core um, component of the Windows system. Uh, all right. Now, uh, I want to introduce you to a little bit of a, uh, you could say, a, a, a conflict of conscience that you will run into and that we will, I, I want to highlight here for you. Uh, we have three personalities that we need to think about. The first one uh, is going to be the um, end user, right? The end user is interested in um, a tool that is just, you know, has the typical features that we talked about in DS1, right? DS1 was all about the end user experience. We didn't care about how difficult it was to build a system. We wanted it to be easy to use. So immediate usability, you know, but if I'm an expert, I want to able to be able to, to tweak a system to my needs, to introduce shortcuts. You know, just the other day, I was completely annoyed that um, Zoom stopped accepting command N as a, as a keyboard shortcut to open a new, you know, session. And so I, started hacking my Windows system um, to, to reintroduce that shortcut to that app. So this is the kind of stuff that end users want, right? The app developer who is working with an existing Windows system, that's going to be you and your you know, professional role as, as developers, maybe, uh, wants, of course, a, a simple but powerful API. We, we Again, we don't care about how much sweat and tears went into building that Windows system at some point. We want an API that you know, saves us as much effort as possible and makes our code easy to run uh, and, and easy to use. Um, so we want an easy to use API, right? That's mostly our interest. Um, and many of the evaluation criteria I just listed are the criteria that you would apply as an application developer who picks a Windows system to base their app on. And then we have a third person. At some point, somebody wrote that Windows system. And we have to remember that these people also had interests, right? They want, for example, maybe an elegant design uh, that is easy to maintain, that is easy to port to new platforms. Uh, you know, those kinds of things will play role, a role on the Windows system developers side. And these three things aren't always in line, right? Um, building a system that is easy to port to new platforms, for example, might mean that I actually you know, introduce something that will sacrifice a bit of end user usability. Um, and, and that's a conflict, or it may might make the API more complex because it's trying to be, you know, covering all kinds of different platforms. Um, why am I talking about this? Because the architecture model that I'm introducing to, the, uh, to you today will actually uh, show us if and how and where we may be able to solve or at least align some of these conflicting interests. Um, and secondly, when we look at real systems, because after the reference model, we'll go through you know, a bunch of real window systems over the time, over history and, and modern ones, old ones, and we will see where they can fall in this 
trade-off space? Was this a window system that was designed just based on you know, principles of elegance and, and portability by window system developers? Um, or was it a system that was you know, really geared towards making apps easy to write? Uh, or was it really geared towards giving the end user an optimum, uh, optimal experience? Now we have uh, the window system reference model. And you will see this picture a lot, OK? So our reference window system consists of four layers. Uh, they are the four blue layers that you see here in the center. Starting at the bottom, a graphics and event library, a base window system, a window manager, and a UI toolkit. This is nestled in to um, beneath that window system, we imagine at some point is the hardware of the computer. Um, and on top of the window system is where the apps are running and uh, you know, that, that uh, application developers write for this architecture. So as we go up, um, the layers tend to become more abstract and the concepts and principles and, and objects and things and, 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 and functions and methods that they support tend to be more centered around user tasks, right? So while the graphics and event library might be very basic you know, uh, event handling commands that um, you're not really, that don't really sound like an end user thing, then the UI toolkit will provide something like, you know, a push button that, you know, is very close to what an end user would actually need in an application. Um, just in a nutshell, what do these things do? Well, the graphics event library is basically providing high performance output functions to draw, right? Uh, to draw basic uh, graphic um, commands um, that can even be used by an app. Uh, if, if it just needs to draw a line, it might actually use something from the graphics event library directly. It doesn't always have to go through all these layers. Some architectures will allow you to bypass some of these layers for performance sake, mostly. Um, and on the other hand, the graphics event library will register input actions and pass them on, right, from the hardware, like, you know, mouse, keyboard, uh, and pass them on to the high layers. It also tends to draw the cursor. The base window system is the heart of the window system, and it provides these logical abstractions from physical resources that I just talked about. When I said we only have one physical mouse, you know, this is it. Everybody needs to deal with this one mouse, but, you know, every application wants to get its own event a uh, series of stream of events that it thinks is, you know, all the mouse input that's necessary and relevant to it. This is what the base window system uh, will do, abstract away. And also does that from on the, on the output side. We only have one physical screen, but everybody wants to draw in their perfect little coordinate system. It doesn't want to worry about other windows maybe partially overlapping the area I'm drawing into. The window manager is basically the UI to the windows that we show. So if I put a document window, like, like a, a, if an application opens up a window, then it usually is decorated with you know, close bars, maximization buttons and stuff like this, um, title bars. And this is what one of the things that the window manager does. But it also uh, will do things like um, define whether I can overlap windows on the system or whether I cannot do that, whether I need to tile my windows as, a, as an application or as an end user. And finally, the UI toolkit, that's actually the layer that as application developers, uh, you will mostly be working with because they provide the functions to create a push button, to draw an actual menu bar, to uh, open up a window, um, to read input from, you know, from the, the user, to react to it and callbacks, et cetera. So mostly, if you've already written applications for graphical user interface environments, um, even if it's something as simple as you know, Java Swing, for example, um, then you have used um, the UI toolkit of our reference model here. Now, this reference model is idealized, of course, right? Um, real systems are often much fuzzier, um, and different levels also uh, tend to shield levels below um, and uh, only provide sort of a defined functionality on an abstract level. But like I said, sometimes we can poke through these levels. Now, you might be wondering, where did the OS go, right? Um, and that is a tricky question because we can't give a you know, we can't give a standard answer for this because systems existing systems solve this quite differently. Conceptually, you can think about the operating system as sitting sort of between the hardware and the GEL, right? So 
many systems um, will tend to have a base OS that just deals with, you know, basically textual uh, command line style um, uh, in, input and output, um, and has all the basic abstractions of processes and memory management, blah, 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 that have nothing to do with the graphical nature of the Windows system. Uh, and then on top of this, you tend to have the uh, window system. So that's a, that often the choice. So that's a good spot to imagine the OS in. But in reality, when you look at really like how are things packaged and what's running in kernel mode and what's running in user mode on, on like a Linux system, for example, you may find that sometimes the entire system is actually the OS. There is no discernible layering difference that you can, um, you know, where you could say, Oh, I'm going to just use this bare OS. I'm not going to even, you know, use the Windows system on an on a on a Linux X Windows machine. You can do that, right? You cannot fire up X at the beginning, and then you have a terminal system, right? Other systems um, tend to not enable that so much. But let's say the OS tends to sit, you know, conceptually down here. Uh, although technically, how it's actually being wrapped uh, into uh, bundles and and layers, um, it may actually. Uh, be that the entire thing is the OS because the OS assumes that there's only one Windows system and then never makes it exchangeable. That's how you know if you run Mac OS or or modern Windows, uh, you don't get to choose different uh, Windows systems, right? It's the one that comes with the with the system. <clears throat> Next question: uh, Where's the user? And for this. Um, May I remind you of another uh, thing that I'm sure you learned. Uh, I'm sure in, in data communication classes, you've talked about the ISO OSI uh, seven layer model, right? Does it ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, okay, I see a couple nods. Um, and this is, I, I'm gonna use that, that um, sort of, you know, that model to explain where the user is because it's not clear where the user is in this picture. On the one hand, we can say on a very uh, physical level, the user is, of course, down there at the hardware, right? The hardware is the display. It outputs pixels on the screen that I see as a user, right? Um, it is also where I create my manual input and, you know, click the mouse or the keyboard and, and, and create events on the physical level. But at the same time, we can say that conceptually, I'm interacting with an app on this high level here, because let's say I'm using a graphics program and I've drawn a wonderful picture and I want to save it. So I will go in and, and I, my, my conceptual model is, uh, I want to now save this image to a directory on, on the hard disk, right? Uh, so that's me on, on, on the abstract you know, thinking level, interacting with the app and, and the UI that it gives me hopefully supports that conceptual thinking, right? It's all DIS1 stuff here. But physically, of course, in the end, I'm creating clicks and, and, and button presses and stuff like this. And I'm looking at output on the screen and maybe listening to you know, um, audio messages from my system. So we can think about this like the OSI model because um, on the one hand, remember in the OSI model, protocols link the stack horizontally, right? Uh, so there's one protocol, that's the abstract protocol, the conceptual protocol where I'm interacting with the app, right? We can say that that is a protocol be between the human and the machine um, interacting on a conceptual level saying, I want to close this application. Where's the close function here? Let me see this, right? And that's the app interaction on the app level. But on the other hand, there's a different protocol of events, click events going in and, and pixels being drawn on the output side that's running on the lowest hardware level here, okay? Um, and you may also remember from the ISO OSI uh, seven layer model that uh, as we go down uh, step by step here, layer by layer, we actually tend to have um, uh, APIs, right? That define how to get from one layer down to the next. And that's exactly true here on the left hand side too, too right? So the app says, okay, the user just told me on this abstract level, he wants to close this, this application. Let me tell the UI toolkit that this, you know, quit button got clicked on the UI toolkit. We'll pass that on, and ultimately, this event uh, will, um, you know, will basically trigger in the app what it's supposed to be doing. So we can imagine um, this a bit like the uh, OSI ISO um, seven-layer model. Now, uh, that's 
the reference model as a whole. Uh, let us start taking a look at the graphics event library um, as the first and most uh, fundamental layer of our reference model. The, the graphics event and event library, uh, we will zoom into it, um, does two things. Um, so here on the left, you have your, your four layer model, right, with the apps and the hardware around it. And we're now looking at the lowest layer here. And it does two things. It, you know, as the name suggests, graphics and event and events. Um, on the event side, let's start with the input side. It takes input um, from the underlying layers of you know, the OS or the hardware. We will call these device drivers. Um, uh, they may be implemented as actual device drivers. They may be implemented by lower levels of the OS. Um, and it takes this data um, and it doesn't do much with it. The graphics event library tends to just canonicalize these events. Uh, what I mean by this, we'll get to in just a second, but in a nutshell, uh, it means that the events are all being turned into having the same format. So rather than being driver specific formatted, they are uh, all in the same driver independent uh, format. Um, and then it puts these into you know, event queues. So our device drivers uh, you know, spew in data, raw data coming in from the mouse, and we turn this into nice mouse events that the system can then process further on. On the output side, um, we get graphical um, commands, um, you know, draw a line or something like this uh, that come in. So the, the uh, graphics library of the graphics and event library part um, typically provides things like draw a line, you know, draw a circle, you know, you know color this pixel, render this letter in, in the font, stuff like that. And it typically turns these commands then into actually um, doing the, the necessary work on the, on the graphics memory to do the actual rendering. Right? Um, also here, as you can see, we can imagine a, uh, that in most cases, um, the things that come into the graphics event library are logical coordinates. They might be pixel-based or they might be um, vector-based. Uh, depends on how the Windows system is being, you know, is designed, as I said before. But in the end, we need some you know, memory addresses to, to actually map that into, a, a, for example, a, a display buffer. Um, now, this may not always be the um, happening inside the, uh, uh, inside the window system itself. Some of these tasks um, uh, can get done, for example, um, by uh, you know, graphics hardware uh, that has, has, has very advanced features built in. Um, or the graphics drivers might take over some of this, but somewhere this action needs to happen, right? I send a command, draw a line uh, from here to there, and somebody needs to ultimately render this on the screen. Now, um, the modern um, uh, OSs actually will often um, inject uh, these uh, things already in there. So, while I say here that the GL takes care of driver-specific data, like a mouse-specific driver, and then uh, turns that into a canonical event, in modern operating systems, what you'll often see is that the underlying OS already, you know, through its drivers that are being installed, already provides a canonical format and injects the events um, into the actual uh, sequence that's going on. Um, uh, remind me again, Zuren, uh, uh I think that we're showing the demo um, for that a little bit later on, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, just yell if I if I forget about this. No, um, it's, it's in the slide set. Oh, wonderful. Good. Uh, now uh, I said that we have different graphics models, right? So let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. We have two fundamental ways in which uh, a window system as a whole can draw. Now, ultimately, today you always need to spew out pixels, right? The screen that you have in front of you, I guarantee you has a pixel display. I don't think anybody is sitting in front of an analog oscilloscope style screen that is actually drawing lines by having a beam being you know, directed one way or the other. Um, that I think we saw only in, what was it, Sketchpad, right? Um, the, the really, really early system in the 60s, that was an actual you know, system that, that could have done vector drawing on the hardware level. We don't do this anymore, right? So ultimately, somebody needs to create pixels. 
So that's not the question here, right? No, no system runs vector-based full on all the way to the rendering on the physical hardware itself. The point is, what can the application do? Does the application already have to commit itself to a pixel-based rendering? Or can the application assume that it has infinite resolution and just basically tell the underlying graphics layers um, that it wants to draw a, um, a line that is you know, one inch long. If the application already needs to decide, uh, need, needs to work with pixels, then we are in a raster up model. The Windows system does not provide a vector abstraction. If the application can run in vector uh, um, units, then it uh, means that the Windows system provides this vector-based drawing abstraction. So raster up is clearly the original graphics model. That's how things started up with the this was first introduced in the in the in the Alto uh, from Xerox Park, um, and it is very well suited to the the bitmap display with its linear video memory. Right? Imagine uh, you you need to store um, the contents of a screen. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to use memory locations, and let's say it's a black and white screen. What are you going to do? Well, every bit of my you know sequence of memory addresses is just going to be one pixel on screen. Right? It's super easy that way. Right? And simple systems still work this way. Um, well, let, let me show you an example of a system that is raster up uh, to this very day. Uh, this is a tiny little um, device that uh, we're using in the, uh, is this getting in focus? Yeah, there, I think sometimes it is. Uh, this is a, a little device that we use uh, in our uh, undergraduate um, programming lab this semester. It's a Pi badge uh, and it's an embedded system. It's kind of like a, like a really, really powerful version of an Arduino. Um, and you can program it, and you can program that built-in you know, TFT screen on there. But sure, I can tell you this has 160 by 120 pixels, and that's exactly what you got to work with, right? Nobody is giving you any, any abstractions on top of that. You are working with these pixels. Now, the problem, of course, is you write an app for this thing. You move to a bigger display that has you know, 250 or 260 or whatever pixels by 320. Uh, my whole app kind of breaks, right? Uh, I need to redesign everything that I drew on the screen because I now have a different number of pixels. And that used to be a huge problem, right? Early uh, software for the Mac that came out as, you know, the first sort of commercial successful um, graphics-based uh, you know, GUI system actually had this issue, right? People were writing apps for this, you know, tiny nine-inch monitor on the original Mac, you know, and the Mac Plus, these little boxes that you might still I've seen occasionally. And then people came up with bigger screens and they were like, oh no, I need to redesign my application to run on this bigger screen. Um, so we, it's, it's very simple. The raster model is very simple to do, uh, but we do have an absolute integer numbers screen coordinate system, right? It goes from zero, zero, typically in the top left, uh, all the way down to whatever, you know, 320, 240 or something. In the on the lower right, or today it's more like you know, 1920 by 1080, right, with full HD. Um, it's very fast because you may not know this, but you know CPUs. If we go down to the level of you know um, what you learned in, in in PSP, for example, if you took uh, the the undergrad uh, classes here, um, you know CPUs are really fast at moving lots of stuff from one memory location to another. They typically have commands that run in an extremely tight and fast loop, or they may even have direct memory memory access uh, co-op co-processors that do this independently of the main CPU. Uh, and and moving stuff around in memory is super fast. So uh, it's called bit block transfer or bit blit, um, and this is ideal for drawing in this raster model. Right? I can take a I, let's say I have a sprite, you know, of a little spaceship, and I want to put this on the screen real fast. I just take this memory bunch and I just blit it out onto the screen, and it's there immediately, it's super fast. But the problem with resolution comes up, of course. Like I said, different screen resolution, everything needs to be recalculated and reprogrammed. Um, uh, but it was still, it was the breakthrough for GUIs, right? Before that. Um, the app developer didn't have access to individual pixels on the screen. Now, there were things like pixels on the screen. As you can see, if you look at a text-based display, of course, the letters were being created by turning a, you know, a, a, an electron beam on and off, and that created things like pixels on the screen. But this was being done by some hardwired hardware, and you could just tell it draw an E you know, or an F or a B. You couldn't tell it to turn that one pixel on or off. 
Um, one other thing that is really neat in the, in the raster op graphics model is a trick to make a mouse cursor move over a background without destroying it. So here's a little uh, tiny little challenge for the guys you are uh, comfortable programming. Let's assume you have a bitmap display, it's black and white, and it has some random pattern on it, right? Some, some content that you don't want to destroy. And I, my task to you is I want you to put a mouse cursor, to render a mouse cursor somehow on top of that screen that I can distinguish, that I can still see. And then I want you to remove that mouse cursor again because it moved to a different location, for example. And I want the original content to be restored as it was before. How would you do that? I'll give you a hint. It's it's a trick that uses a particular logical operation. Um, yeah, uh, Leila, go ahead. I would just switch the bits. Like um, I don't know what's the bitwise operation called, but if I have yeah. a zero, I will turn it to a one, and if I move it away, I would just say, yeah, switch the bits again, and yep. that way we will see the mouse anyway. Exactly. You just reinvented the XOR operation. That's exactly what we're doing, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so exactly, right? You so by, by just inverting every pixel of the where you want the mouse cursor to be. Uh, if it's all white, then the mouse cursor will be all black. If it's all black, it will be all white. If it's speckled, then the mouse cursor will be speckled. But you will be able to see it, right? It will distinguish itself from the background. And then if you do that again, you restore the original content. So this XOR trick. Uh, was incredibly popular uh, and still is if you want to quickly draw something on a screen and, and remove it again. Um, somebody actually tried to patent that, believe it or not. Um, and I have to say, this doesn't work quite as smoothly for color screens, right? Because then things get more iffy, but um, it, it's, a, it's a great trick. Now, the vector model, on the other hand, uh, says that the API that I program my application against, right, on top of the Windows system, will provide me with a normalized coordinate system. It will say something like, you have, you know, a screen that is, I don't know, uh, 10 by 8 inches or something like this. And then inside the... Uh, in the, the Windows system, this will get actually transformed based on the, the device that I'm using. Um, and the advantage then is that the units are not the pixels of a particular device anymore that I'm working with, but they are actually mathematical units, right, that I can work with. And so my application can draw the exact same data to various screens um, and always get the best possible resolution. That's another big advantage, right? If I just say, draw a circle, and I draw this with a mathematical underlying model, and it will always be as round and nice as, as the pixels allow, right? Um, if I have more resolution, my circle will come out more nicely. Um, if I send the same picture to a printer that has you know, 300 dots per inch then, or, or 1,200 dots per inch, then it will become even nicer. And some systems actually did use um, the same code to render on the screen as they did render onto printers. Um, this was done using something called Display PostScript. You may know PostScript from, from printing. Uh, it's, a, it's a language, it's a very simple language that lets you define what to draw on the printer. And it does that in a resolution independent way. Um, and there was a version of um, PostScript called Display PostScript that was used to create um, device independent and resolution independent drawing on Windows systems. Uh, in fact, a um, uh, Mac OS X, when it was developed, um, the one that I'm running here today, um, the early versions of that actually used um, a, a variant of Display PostScript to do this. So let's start taking a look at the, uh, uh, the canvas as the first object, because you're going to see that a lot. Um, now, I need to explain that the objects we're talking about here will actually appear on, on several layers, some of them. Some of them we're going to continue seeing uh, at various different levels. Um, and that's just because oftentimes an object will reappear at a higher level and be made available, but in a more user-centered uh, way, right? In a more user-friendly uh, uh, format that the application developer can make more use of. Uh, thanks, folks, for turning um, your cameras back on so you can see each other and, and see me and I can see you guys. Um, that's really helpful to, to see whether everybody has already fallen asleep or whether you're still with me. 
Right. So the 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 canvas is a, is basically just a memory area that has a, uh, a a coordinate system and a mapping of memory to pixels. Right. That's all it is. There are different ways to do this. Um, I want to um, distinguish two simple ways here, um, and I've done this by visualizing the first three values that that would be inside memory. Right. So if you say um, you have a a canvas, then that canvas will sit somewhere in memory. So it will have a start address, sure, right? It will also have a size. You, know, you might say, oh, it's sitting at, you know, address so-and-so, and it has a size of, I don't know, 2K um, um, of, of memory. And then uh, you will know that it will be, for example, for uh, an area of, I don't know, 20 by 15 pixels or something like this. Um, the next thing you will know is its bit depth. Is it a black and white thing? Is it just a one bit per pixel um, uh, canvas? Or does it have multiple bits per pixel, which then means that you can do color? And there are different ways to do color. We'll talk about this later on. Um, but the next thing you need to know about your canvas is uh, how does the, error, the, the order in memory actually map to what's happening on the screen, right? How does it uh, relate to the pixels in the image? Um, there are two ways to do this. Um, the first one is probably the one that you would more, most naturally pick, and it's called the Z format. In this, let's say we want to do um, a nice color uh, graphic, right? So we need a canvas for a nice color graphic, and we want to use one byte for red, one byte for green, and one byte for blue, right? RGB, um, 256 different values for each color gives us a nice you know, 24 bit um, color resolution. So that's that's pretty neat. Um, and it's a typical thing you see in, you know, when you launch, I don't know, Photoshop and you, you know, pick a color, oftentimes you get a choice of, you know, eight bits for each um, of these three channels. Now, the natural way to store this would be, well, first pixel needs one byte of red, one byte of green, one byte of blue. We're gonna just put all three of these bytes, you know, next to each other. And that's the first pixel. And after that comes all the data for, the next pixel down. That's the Z format. This is really handy um, if you quickly in your code need to access a particular pixel because it's super easy to calculate where that pixel data is. And then you just need to access the three bytes right there. You don't need to jump around in memory to collect big different parts of your pixel. It's all in one location, right? These three consecutive bytes. And uh, now three is a number that makes computer scientists a little unhappy, right? Because it's not a it's not a power of two, but hey, you know, it's still pretty good. The other way to store things is the XY format in which we actually take first and, and put first all the information about, let's say, for example, the red channel into memory. So you would have bytes that say the red value for the first pixel, red value for the second pixel, red value for the third pixel, and so on. And once you're done with the red pixels, then comes a separate area for the green pixels, and then comes a separate area for the blue pixels. Um, why would I do this? Well, it makes it harder to access all of the color information for a single pixel, but what it makes very simple is to access all the data for a particular color channel. So for example, taking a picture and changing it to be less red Right to maybe adjust for or like to adjust for like do a night shift right where you basically increase the the warm colors and reduce the cold the cool colors in your image that would be pretty easy in this format. Remember what I said before: accessing contiguous sequences of memory is always great. Right, programmers love that. It's there's very fast commands all the way down to the CPU level, the assembler level to do this, and also it means that I can just fetch a big chunk of data from you know the, the SSD or from RAM or wherever it is. And I don't need to jump around and do seeks and, and collect stuff from everywhere. So it's always nice to have things in one contiguous place. And so for these kinds of things, that is pretty useful. There are other ways in which you can use this format. So for example, um, I'll give you two examples. Um, I, I used to have an old 80s sort of home computer that had just a black and white pixel display, right? That was, so that was contiguous in memory. And then after that came a separate layer that contained color data that said for certain chunks of it, just eight by eight pixels at a time, I could define a color. So the color resolution was less than the actual pixel resolution. That's also an example where you would put these things one after the other. Or to, uh, to take a, um, 
uh, another example, when you have a, a cursor that you're trying to display, people often have a separate memory layer that's just a black and white bitmap that comes before the main screen memory. And they put the cursor on that level so they can manipulate the cursor very quickly um, and it doesn't interfere with the main uh, screen memory at all. All right. Um, so graphics libraries provide canvases as program, as data structures, if you want, right, that you can use. Um, and that higher levels will then use, um, higher levels of the Windows system. Next thing they provide is functions uh, or objects that you can output. Elementary things like lines, circles, you know, pix maps that you can draw. Um, just for wording, bitmap, you know, we tend to call everything a bitmap. You know, technically speaking, a bitmap is only black and white. If you have more than one bit per, per pixel, we tend to call them pix maps or raster images. Um, and um, these things are typically easy to, um, to, to render using the graphics event library. Um, what they're also often provide is more complex things like uh, fonts, for example, right? They might provide a way, you know, typically graphics libraries uh, provide a way to render text. Uh, and they do this um, by, you know, the text is being broken down into glyphs, uh, raster images of each, each um, uh, letter. Um, and those can, again, be done in a vector-based way or in a, in a, a raster-based way. Uh, early systems used raster-based fonts. So that meant that the font was actually designed for a particular screen resolution, right? It knew that it was going to be get rendered at, on, a, on a screen that had 72 dots per inch, for example. Um, and uh, only then it would you know, look okay and have the right size, like be, be an actual 12-point font if it was advertised as a 12-point font. Um, later on, we got vector fonts. Um, uh, and that's one of the things that, that made Adobe very rich, right? Um, and, and these vector fonts then get broken down by the engine at runtime into actual pixels. It's slower, of course, but it means that you can scale um, your, your data um, um, automatically. Now, um, again, if you think back to GIS-1, you may remember something I said about fonts back there, uh, which actually goes into typographer's expertise, right? You cannot just take a 12-point a, a font and just blow it up to make it, let's say, an 84-point font, right? You can't just take it, um, you know, times seven and, and be done with it. It doesn't work that way. Um, because our eye will find that blown up font to look out of, out of proportion and out of scale. Uh, so actual topographers will tell you that you need to actually change the line thickness of things as you scale things up uh, in a font because our eye, the way that our eye naturally works. And modern fonts, for example, the, uh, the open type um, uh, defined font format actually contain these hints that tell the computer how to scale these fonts up and how to scale them up, not just by blowing them up or shrinking them down, but by actually changing thicknesses and things like that as they change in size so that they look really nice at all different sizes. So that typographer's expertise has been poured into the actual format of the font in modern systems. All right, so these are uh, objects that the graphics library will provide to you that you can output using the functions it has. Um, next thing, and that's also something you will see a lot, is the graphics context. Imagine the graphics context as a little bit of a state uh, diagram, or, or no, not a state, a, a, a state being recorded of a virtual graphics processor. The goal of it is to reduce the parameters that you need to actually pass when you're calling graphics uh, operations. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say you want to render um, lots of strings on the screen. You need to write lots of text. You're writing, let's say you're an app developer writing something like Microsoft Word. So you need to put lines and lines of text on the screen, right? To show the current page of text that the user is looking at. You don't want every single letter that you render or every single string that you render or every single line even, you don't want to always have to tell the computer and the graphics event library again, by the way, I want you to use the font Gilson in 24 point, use the font color black, you know, that's RGB 000, and use a line width of two pixels. You don't want to always tell the computer that the GL that for every single drawing call of a string that you send it. So instead, what you do is you set these attributes once, 
by calls into the graphics library. And guess what happens? These, these attributes are being set in what's called a graphics context. So you are filling in the lines of this table here, basically, which is the graphics context of the graphics event library. And then you tell it, and now with the current settings, basically with your current palette that you've collected of, of you know, text color and line thickness, and et cetera, this is what I want you to execute the next 2,000 drawing commands with until I tell you to change it. This is way more efficient, of course, but not always provided on this level. Uh, but many modern graphics event libraries do this, um, and they reduce uh, the amount of parameters that you need to pass in when calling graphics operations. Because once I have these things set up, I can just tell it things like draw a string at coordinates x and y, because those are going to be new for every single uh, call. And the string itself is, of course, going to be new. But everything else, it will just derive from its current graphics context. Okay. That's why you can imagine it literally like a, an artist's palette that has certain colors that I put on there and certain brush sizes, basically. And I pick these, and this is what I'm working with until I'm told otherwise. That's the graphics context. Another topic that is uh, quite challenging for the graphics library is how do we draw things and how do we draw things so that we can redraw them if necessary? There are three modes. The simplest mode is direct drawing. And that's probably the mode that you would implement if naively you were asked to write your own graphics library um, and you, you know, didn't have much time and you didn't want to go and go get fancy. You would just say, well, if an application tells me to draw you know, a tree and, and whatever, uh, an elk or whatever this is, um, onto a screen, um, then that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that into a video memory, right? Into the into the graphics memory that that is there for the screen. But after rendering it, I'm going to directly forget what I did. It doesn't mean that it goes away on the screen, but it means that I, as a graphics event library, do not keep track of what I just drew. And you might say, "Well, that sounds perfectly fine. Why wouldn't why would you do anything else?" Well, the point is. The moment that something else gets drawn on top of this, like another window, like maybe a dialog box pops up, everything's still fine. I can render the dialog box. But what if the dialog box goes away? Then I need to uncover and redraw part of that you know, tree and that, and that moose or uh, whatever the animal is. And I need to actually tell the system what was there earlier on. I need to re refill these things. And with direct drawing, I can't do that as the GEL. If, you know, in this case, somebody else would have to do that. And that's usually ends up being the app. We're going to talk about that in a second. The second way I can do drawing is uh, with what's called a um, display list. Um, and what that means is that the drawing commands um, are being, I, I basically keep a log of everything that I have been told to do. Right. So if I was told to set the fill color to green, to fill uh, a path that was basically that shape of that tree, and then set the fill color um, to orange and fill the path of that deer in front of it, um, then I keep track of these commands. Right. And of course, I would have more information, right? The X and Y coordinates, for example, where these things are. But that's you know, just to show you the kind of commands that would be kept track of. And if I keep a tab of all these things, if I keep a little you know, memory list of what I did, right? Um, then I can actually uh, redraw later on by just replaying that command list, right? Now, this way of, of keeping track of what's being drawn is very efficient if I only have a few things to draw. If I have a big screen with lots of, you know, pixels, I don't actually need a backup copy of the entire screen somewhere just so that I can restore things on the screen if they are asked for. I can just keep track of these very few commands to draw things, and I can recreate everything by just running these commands again. But mostly what we see today, and this was, for example, being used by things like you know, the, the Sketchpad system would do that, right? It would just keep track of the uh, objects that it needed to draw, and it, if the screen needed to be refreshed, it would just redraw all its objects again. 
today what we see mostly is data buffer drawing. And that means if somebody tells me, me being the graphics event library, to draw the following thing into the screen, like this tree and this, and this deer, I will actually draw them as requested, but I will also draw them into a backup area in memory. Um, this means I, I essentially have two copies now. One is in my backup uh, memory area. This is typically a canvas, right, of the size of the entire screen and the same bit depth, et cetera. Uh, and then I will either also draw it as things come in into the display, or I will wait until a certain amount of time has passed, let's say a 60th of a second, and then I will put the entire buffer that I have onto the screen in one big fell swoop, right, in one go. That's a very typical frame-by-frame -frame rendering that, that modern engines tend to do. That's why I often hear about, you know, 60 frames per second uh, rendering um, essentially means this, right, 60 frames, 60 times a second, I refresh everything that's on the screen. Um, this is memory intensive, right? I need now storage for the entire screen again, right? Um, and that would have been forbiddingly expensive in terms of memory for early systems, but today this is not a big deal. Uh, and it's very efficient and I have lots of context if I have lots of stuff that I need to render. These three modes have different uh, ways to recover when we need to repair some damage. Um, when we have these buffered modes, uh, command line buffered or, uh, or data buffered, then the graphics event library can actually redraw the content that was being destroyed. Um, but it just, it just needs to be told that, it needs, that this needs to happen. Um, so what, what, what am I talking about here? Well, let's take a simple example. We've got an empty screen, just a desktop, right? Um, we draw a first window, and I'm drawing this really slowly here, so you can imagine you know, the bits literally being moved onto the screen here. Um, and now a second application comes in and puts the window partly in front of the first one. This, me being the graphics event library, I draw onto the screen. I have now destroyed part of the content of the blue window, right? That's been covered. It has been replaced on the screen, at least, with the content of the orange window in this overlapping area. So the screen no longer has any idea of what was in the blue window, but it doesn't, the screen doesn't need to because it's only showing what's visible. But what if I now remove this orange window by closing it? Now I have a gap. And somebody needs to remember what was in that blue window before. As we said, in these buffered modes, the GEL will know what to put there because it kept track either by command list or by a data buffer and can refresh this. So when it gets a command to kill this window um, and remove it from the screen, it can not only remove the window, it can also automatically repair any damaged areas behind it. Secondly, in uh, direct mode, if the GL did not keep track of this, the application will need to redraw. Um, and that is typically when the application is then sent a command up the, you know, up the hierarchy by the GL saying, all right, application, uh, somebody just closed the window in front of you and uncovered an area of your, of your window. Um, and I don't know what you had in there. We all forgot about it. So we need you to redraw this. And this means then that the application needs to go in and actually redraw what it used to, you know, what it already had drawn in there. And applications use the same techniques. They usually implement either a backup buffer that they draw into, uh, or they implement a command list, right? If, if it's a highly, if it's a very simple drawing in terms of the commands, like a, a CAD program that just needs a few mathematical commands to create a very complex figure, or let's say it's it's a, a you know like a Lissajou figure right that just needs a three lines of code to be created, but it's very complex graphically. I might actually keep the commands around to redraw this. If you know if it's not that easy, then I'm typically going to work um, with just the uh, the buffer right the data buffer in my application. Okay, and then we can actually refill these things. Now the mouse cursor. Uh, it tends to be a little bit of a different beast, right? The mouse cursor also has the same issue. Um, in colored screens, we can't use the cool XOR technique that uh, that uh, Leia and I uh, sort of reinvented. Um, so we need to do something else, right? Um, if the mouse cursor moves across, what would tend to happen is that the mouse cursor would basically just leave uh, this space blank, right? So we need to restore that. And that is typically uh, then, you know, this restoring typically happens um, 
by the GL itself. So the GL tries to keep track of that, whatever it, it uh, destroyed with the mouse cursor, it will refill one way or another. The GL also usually does clipping. Uh, so if, a, if somebody tells the GL, draw this really big circle, you know, a circle that's bigger than the screen, the GL will say, sure, I can do that. And it will just automatically limit the drawing to the screen area so that you know, no screen draws try to go out of bounds and draw to coordinates that don't even exist. Um, <clears throat> now, let's look at the event side of things. We've looked at the graphic side of things, so the output side of the GL we've got now sort of figured out, but what about the event library? Uh, the event part of the GL um, is responsible for taking driver-specific input, so very in a driver-specific format, and to canonicalize it, so to turn it into a common format for all kinds of events that might be coming in to the Windows system. Uh, we're going to zoom in into this graphic so you can read it a bit better. So this is the event side of the event library. Um, so this is what happens. Uh, let's take a look at what we got at the bottom here. At the bottom here, we have four events. Um, and these are events that are queued up in the mouse driver event queue, right? And, and, and these drivers can be pretty stupid, right? Um, so for example, here we have an event, the first event tells us that none of the three buttons on the mouse were pressed. Uh, X hasn't changed, but the Y coordinate changed by one, uh, you know, one unit of the mouse. Remember, this is, you know, the mouse is a relative input device, as we learned in the design space of input devices. So it will never tell me that the mouse is currently at position X or Y will just tell me that it moved by so much in Delta X or Delta Y. And the wheel wasn't used. And there's a timestamp that the drive that the mouse created uh, in its driver specific format. Who knows what kind of timestamp uh, format that uh, mouse driver uses. Um, for example, if you have, if you might remember old PS2 mice, they literally had a dedicated clock pin that would you know get synchronized. And every time that you know, pin would trigger, it would just say, here's the next value, right? But, but it was at that frequency of that, of that internal clock with a fixed sampling rate. Um, next event says, ooh, now, um, you know, a little bit later, some, some, you know, milliseconds or whatever that unit here is, later, um, we got uh, the button one down. And then yet another few event cycles later for the mouse, um, the button was being released again. Uh, and then finally, we see that yet another few moments later, the uh, Y coordinate uh, changed again, right? So the cursor was moved uh, again by a little bit in, in the Y direction. So these are typical examples of what the mouse driver sends. This is very different from what a keyboard driver would send. And we need to find a common format for all of these things. So what you can see here is that what the graphics event library will do is it will turn this into a canonical event. Um, and that means that the first event might be, for example, called movement or, or mouse movement or, or, or mouse moved or something like this. Uh, and it might it will have a value and it will have a value that is going to have X and Y movement in one go. And by scaling the uh, this purport, uh, appropriately, because hopefully um, the driver somehow um, told the um, told the window system, you know, what the DPI resolution of the mouse is. And then, you know, the. Uh, settings in the Windows system will say how many pixels this one movement of the mouse is supposed to be meaningful uh, as, as pixel movements on the screen, right? So the, the Windows system will say, whenever the mouse gives me one tick to the right, that will mean one a, a jump of maybe two pixels on my screen, right? With modern high-res screens, that's, that's not an unlikely mapping. Uh, and it will also give it uh, uh, an actual mapping uh, with a, uh, an actual timestamp that is in the computer's own internal clock that is synchronized over all uh, subsystems of the computer. Uh, the next event then gets turned into what's called a mouse down event because the window system has at some point decided that when the button that's called button one on the mouse gets pressed, this is supposed to be the mouse down event that we use to, for example, select things as opposed to maybe a right click or something. Um, we see here that the mouse down event is mapped not, it's not just uh, is a type of an event, but its value actually tells us which of the mouse buttons was pressed. And here we see that button one is mapped here to be the left uh, mouse button. 
Now, if a right-handed person were to use this window system, they might go in and, and kind of change some contra configurations inside the window system, which would then turn button one into being the right mouse button instead. So that for, you know, um, for the, um, the mapping for a right-handed person versus left-handed person, it still made sense to use the, you know, dominant and non not so dominant fingers. Uh, then we see a mouse up event later on and, and another movement here. Um, and you will also see that the uh, the movements here are actually uh, different from what we had what we had earlier on here, right? So here we see the x change in this change by six and this change by one, uh, and this is being mapped and scaled up into a movement of twelve comma two pixels relative to its previous position, right? All right, so um, this is the kind of canonicalization of events, right? The mouse driver had something very specific. And we now have events that we can put right alongside keyboard events, for example, and it will all make sense. And if a user is moving the mouse and pressing keys at the same time, we need to actually interleave these events and make sure that they come in in the right global order so that I don't, you know, like press, click on a window and press a key. I got to make sure that that key press goes to the window that I just clicked on, right? Because I activated the window by clicking on it. It can't go to a different window, then that would be wrong in terms of what the user intended. So here's an example. Um, you know, aside from this mouse mouse cue that we've now uh, canonicalized with these events here, we will also have a keyboard cue um, that has things like um, the I key being uh, uh, released, and then the one key gets pressed, and then the one key gets released, and then the zero gets pressed. And all these kinds of things will be coming in. Um, and then there could be others. For example, on a laptop, you might have a trackpad, right? And the trackpad could give you events like, you know, touch started, moved, touch ended, um, things like this. Um, so we still have, however, one queue for each device, right? So this means that we still have one queue per device. We haven't merged these together yet into this one global ordered sequence yet. That's going to be the task of the base window system that's in the next level up. Um, and in order to illustrate um, that these things are actually happening, uh, Sebastian has prepared a little demo that I thought we should really show. Uh, so um, Sebastian, do you want to take over the screen from me? Um, if it works. Yeah, it works. <laughs> Looks like it does. Yeah, we're seeing core graphics right, right now. Yeah, you're seeing the documentation uh, because I uh, thought we start with a little documentation. So when we work with the four layer reference model, uh, we look at everything very theoretically and conceptually. And it might sound very weird in the first place that there is a layer that is about drawing, so drawing output and events. And I thought, why don't we look into the real world, for instance, on macOS and have a look how this layer exists there. And basically the documentation is already proof because if you have a look at the core graphics framework, you will find out that it says it's a framework for lightweight 2D rendering. And then on macOS, it's also for low level user input events to the windowing system. So. Um, I've highlighted the mouse cursor inside core graphics. You will find things like uh, a CG context there. Um, so you can have drawing context, drawing parameters. Um, it can work with bitmap data, data and stuff. And there's also quartz event services. They contain things like create a mouse event or create a keyboard event, and then finally distribute these events um, into the window system. Um, and I thought, what, how simpler can a program be than like this uh, really simple C terminal program on macOS? What you see here is exactly um, using this API. So you see it's all pretty old C API um, because of course macOS also has its origins in the 80s, so to speak. Uh, and what happens here is I'm creating a mouse event and then I'm posting the mouse event in the window system. So 
when I'm doing this in a for loop with a little sleep in between, you will see that when I execute this program, my mouse cursor, which is highlighted with this pink circle, will move around my screen. And this is not specific to the application. So uh, these uh, highlights in the menus will still be triggered. Even if I switch the application, for instance, to Safari, you will see that the highlighting there works as well. My mouse cursor changes. I can try to grab my mouse and drag around, but still these events that I inject into the Windows system will be executed. And there's basically nothing uh, that I can stop while this app is running um, to get control over my mouth again. So um, this is really just this quick example. The GL exists, for instance, in macOS with core graphics, and um, it has exactly the functionalities that you would expect uh, from the lecture. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I will um, get us back on and, and, and share my screen again. Here we go. Um, so I thought this was really great to see that um, these things exist, right? Events are there and, and they are a construct on this basic level of the GEL. Um, and, and what Sebastian just did was basically kind of uh, an important part that every Windows system will support, which is events cannot just be created by devices, like a, a mouse cannot is not the only one that can create these things, but events can also be injected into the system and sort of be created by code, right? And that's exactly what he did there to make his mouse move move magically and um, um, like nobody was uh, around to actually do the do the action. So um, a couple of things about the GL to to wrap this up. Uh, first of all, the the interesting question is, of course, as I said, we always wonder about extensibility, right? This is a architectural decision of the Windows system. Um, how extensible is the Windows system on each level? Some systems are super flexible, open source. You can hack every single layer and change it for your own purposes for research, for example. Um, others are, you know, commercial systems tend to be much more closed um, and don't provide much access because they don't want to give away their tricks. In most systems, the GEL is not directly accessible to the application developer if they are writing an application on top of, you know, the, 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 the whole stack. Um, but uh, if the GEL is implemented as a library, which is usually the co the the, the 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 case, right? It's 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 a bunch of code, right? It's a framework that you load and that you compile with your with your with your application um, as a library. Then uh, you can't extend it, right? Because the only way to extend it and to change it would be to actually have access to the source code of that library. Um, X11, for example, does that, right? So if you, since X is, a, is an open source Windows system, you can get the source code for the graphics event library and you can go in and change it. And you can, if you are a big fan of pentagrams, you can add a function to the graphics event library to draw a pentagram. And then your GL for X will now support a call, draw a pentagram. But your, if you use that special call, it also means that nobody else can use it unless they run an X version with your specific version of the GL, right? So everybody needs to recompile their, their complete X window system and, and you know, or use a new binary for the X window system in order to run your app. So that's not a great way to extend it, but for research, that's often actually a great hack. Um, I see lots of people use the X window system even today uh, because they want to try something new with uh, respect to how Windows systems work. And so then they go in and, and change things like that uh, and use it just to implement, you know, a proof of concept prototype. Some systems uh, uh, support actually extending the functionality of the graphics event library at runtime by an interpreted language. The, the new use Windows system, which you'll find out about in the, in the reading assignment, um, actually does that. For example, since News was one of these systems that also was resolution independent and introduced um, Display PostScript, um, it allowed you to um, basically tell the GEL, here's a bit of PostScript code, learn this, and let's call it pentagram, right? So the GEL would store away this bit of code, uh, and you could then later call it, and it would execute that PostScript code, and it would mean that now the GEL had a new command 
to draw a pentagram. Why is this inter interesting? Well, because if you had to draw 500 pentagrams uh, you know, per, per millisecond or something, you don't want to send all these individual drawing commands to the GL every single time, because that is going to be create a lot of calling overhead um, in, your, in your code. Instead, you wanted to just tell it once how to do this, and then tell it, now please do this 500 times. Right? Then you don't have much less up and down in your, in your code, much less function call overhead, um, and that was much more effective. You know, things like patterns to fill a large area with, for example, are a prime candidate for these kinds of things, uh, or grid lines, right? If you needed to to draw a grid, um, so this is a this is sometimes possible, um, but not not a very common feature of the graphics event library to be able to extend uh, to be extended that way. Um, also, the event library, of course, the, uh, the the event side of the GL needs to be uh, looked at, can it be extended? And for that, that often means how well does it support new devices? I, I love one example that we'll get to this later, but I want to tease it here. Uh, the first version of the Java window system, uh, you know, that came with Java, the abstract windows toolkit was actually written in, I think like six weeks or so. And it literally had mouse and keyboard hard coded as devices into it. Like there was no other device existed in the world of the first Java window toolkit. Um, so of course, you know, you have a laptop with a touchpad, you want to write a Java app using that, tough luck, right? No way to do this with this very first version. So we want, of course, the, the, the um, event library also to be able to support um, adding new devices. And even if it's just because I have a new driver and that new driver um, creates touchpad events and it creates them in a format that, you know, I can... I can understand, then at least you know, we want the higher layer levels to be able to understand that this gets added um, to the vocabulary of the Windows system. All right, so that wraps up the graphics event library, right? Um, it, in, in summary, it hides aspects of the operating system and the hardware. Um, it offers, um, you could almost say, a virtual graphics engine, right? a virtual graphics machine. Um, that has commands to, to draw graphics primitives. And it also offers a virtual event machine that um, uh, basically delivers queues of events. There are still separate queues for mouse, keyboard, other devices, one queue per device, but they all come out with the same format. So they are ready to be merged on the next layer up, which is the base window system. The graphics event library is often implemented for performance reasons in the same address space as its next layer up, the base window system. So these two are often merged into one address space, meaning that they are running in the same process and they have very fast ways of uh, accessing each other. Because if I'm in the same address space, I'm just you know a function call away, right? Um, so it's very, very quick to move back and forth to the base window system. Many objects that we've talked about, like you know, the canvas, for example, or the event, will also have what I call peer objects on higher levels. So objects on higher levels that do the same thing. Um, and uh, for example, we will find that the base window system uh, will define what's called the window. Notice that the graphics event library hasn't talked about windows yet, right? We haven't introduced the concept of a window yet on the graphics event library. It doesn't know what that is. It only knows about canvases and, 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 and rectangular areas maybe um, that, that it can render to a screen area, but it doesn't understand the concept of a window. It doesn't need to. Uh, the base window system will introduce that concept uh, as a very simple thing. Um, and uh, that base window system concept of a window, so that data structure will actually have as one component uh, a canvas. And that's a canvas like uh, what the GEL provides. Today, the uh, after the GL, the second part that I want to talk about is this second layer up in the in the four layer reference model, and that's the base window system. It is clearly the core of each window system. Um, it provides window system wide data structures and operations. It manages uh, shared resources to ensure consistency. Uh, shared resources means um, we only have one physical mouse, you know, one physical screen, one physical keyboard, uh, one physical memory, one physical processor. Um, and all these physical resources need to be 
shared by all the applications. Now, for lots of these things, like for example, memory, uh, the underlying OS already takes care of that, right? It provides ways to make sure that I can access memory and that I can claim memory, release it again, and so on. Similarly, for the processor, that's a task of the OS. But mouse input, for example, if you know an underlying OS like Unix doesn't have that built in as its natural thing because it's a, essentially a command line based um, text only um, uh, operating system that only understands files and, and, and streams and things like this, then we need to add this abstraction, right? We need to make sure that the, what the mouse creates as events is somehow available to all the applications and the applications don't need to worry about who was the addressee of a particular event. Uh, if they get an event, they can assume that it was meant for them. That's the task of the base window system. Um, shared resources management uh, is also meant uh, because we want things to be consistent. For example, um, we can also share things like um, uh, uh, fonts, for example, and say, oh, hey, you know, you don't need to separate copies of this font. So as I mentioned earlier on, this avoids things like version drift, for example. Now, uh, the base window system provides the concept of a window, but I'm calling it a base window. Uh, and, and this is a source of no end of confusion oftentimes. Um, that's why I'm, I'm using a, a, a separate name here. Understand when you think window, you probably think of the thing you see in front of you when you open up a new you know, Microsoft Word document, right? Or a web browser window. That's like nicely decorated. It has closed bars and, and whatnot, and it has some content inside it, maybe even a little menu bar inside it. That's way too complex. That's a window on the highest level of an application. We are a couple levels down. The base window is called a window, but all it really is, is essentially a rectangular area on the screen, pretty much, right? So a base window is a logical canvas that includes the on-screen uh, windows and or widgets. So in that example that I just gave of the Microsoft Word document window, uh, you actually have lots of base windows making up that document window. Even an OK button has its own base window. It has its own rectangular area on the screen that it has claimed where it's being drawn uh, and where it receives events. So base windows are really rectangular areas on the screen. Um, in general, we can say that a window system um, will usually need to uh, make many applications work together, right? Many applications are running on your laptop right now, probably and they're all being managed by one window system. Um, each of these applications has a bunch of different objects that it's, that it's using, right? And that also need to be synchronized and, and managed and, and coherently uh, shared. For example, uh, you know, the window, the, the, the applications you've got running might have several windows open, right? Windows in the application sense. They might be using fonts, um, but there are also, very obviously shared resources like the menu bar. Like if you're running a Mac, then you've got a menu bar at the top of your screen. Uh, if you're running Windows, you tend to have a start task bar thing at the, at the bottom of your screen. And in there, mon many applications can actually put things next to each other, right? They, they, they sort of share that space and can put things there without interfering with others. So that's another example for a shared resource that needs to be managed quite, quite cleverly. And then in the widest possible sense, we don't just have multiple applications, each of them with lots of objects. Uh, we even could have multiple terminals. Now, I will admit that this is a bit of an artificial um, overgeneralization because the only example I have for this would be the X window system in which you could actually have multiple uh, stations, consoles that are actually have screens of an application. So I could actually write an X window application that renders one screen on, on my computer screen here, and that renders another window of it uh, on, uh, let's say, you know, uh, Jane's screen, for example, right? Uh, that's actually possible with X. I can write an application that talks to multiple consoles and, 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 and user um, displays at the same time. Uh, but it's a pretty rare case. 
Okay, so just understand that base windows are not your, your window that you naively have in mind when you think of, of document windows. So the base window system also um, has two main directions of, of, of tasks. Uh, one is on the input and one on the output side. On the input side, it basically uh, works with objects such as events. Um, and it has some elementary operations such as queuing or dequeuing these events. Then um, it will need to deal with synchronization. In the case of events, that means that it needs to first multiplex all these events. But multiplexing, I mean merging all the event queues together into one. Because ultimately, we need to know there's only one event we can really react to as the next event, right? That that's supposed to be handled next. So we need to know what's the what's the global order of all the events coming in from all these different queues. Once we have this next event, we then need to take this event and demultiplex it again. We need to understand, okay, there's an event that we need now, now need to handle. It's a click on a window, but which window and which app, right? Um, so we need to find out where that event actually belongs to, and we need to pass it on to the right um, uh, application that is supposed to receive this event. Um, so this is a this is a tricky business. Um, this this addressing of, of finding the right uh, addressee for an for an event. Um, on the other side, um, what it's getting so it's delivering things like uh, input for for dialogues, right? You know, the user just clicked OK in this dialogue, or um, you know, the user just pressed the X key or something like this. On the other end, it provides a way for applications to. Uh, give the base window system output requests, right? Things to draw, uh, things to change, stuff like this. And for that, it needs to make sure uh, that certain resources that are being shared are only accessible to those that have that are that are allowed to access them. Very simple example. Uh, let's say I have a, a window of an application running, and now I put another window on top of that, of another application. I'm sorry, on top, like this. So now this other application, it can render into its window, sure. But what if it wants to draw outside its window? What if it wants to draw beyond its window bounds and start drawing onto this first window? That would be illegal, right? We don't want that to happen. We want that to be clipped. So this is what I mean by access control, that we need to make sure that everybody only works in their own uh, you know, allowed space. Um, and this is this is rarely broken. For example, there's one exception to this rule of you can only draw inside your windows, which is the system tray, right, uh, or the menu bar. Whereas sometimes you know applications can actually put stuff, but there are very clear rules on how you can do that. Um, and even if you have uh, even if you have already buffered drawing in your GL, you still need to make sure that an app doesn't edit any uh, pixel buffers that aren't actually belonging to it, right? We need to have uh, this kind of access control, and then you can imagine that you know on the on the output side, uh, we need to do sometimes mutual exclusion things so that, for example, if two applications want to update um, things in in the system tray or in, in the menu bar, uh, that they can only do this one after the other. If it's a shared resource, um, uh, we need to you know provide things like memory to these applications, and we provide need to provide them with uh, basic things like canvases, right? And then from there on, the, uh, the base window system will use the graphics event library, the graphics part of the graphics event library, to pass on its request further down the line um, into the next layer down into the graphics library. Now, like with the GL, let's take a look at some of the um, objects and actions we can do in the uh, base window system. The base window system provides a whole bunch of objects, windows and canvases, events, graphics, contexts, color tables, and fonts. And we're going to take a quick look at each of these now. Windows and, and canvases are uh, a, a very fundamental part of the base window system. As I said, uh, the difference here is that a canvas is a memory area where things uh, get rendered, and they can get mapped to a screen when, they, when, when this is needed. Um, and a window is basically um, a canvas that also is actually currently displayed on screen. So there are a couple things in uh, in both of these 
uh, that are uh, that are typical for these kinds of objects, right? They will typically be owned by an application, right? Some application owns a window, uh, but in the example of let's say the the system tray, um, the owner of this application might be the the window manager. Uh, the the owning application might be the window manager, but there might be several other applications that use this part because they want to put stuff in there. Um, so there could be several users of this uh, uh, this window. Um, or canvas and only one owner, of course. Um, then, of course, they have the typical graphical attributes, you know, the size and X and Y dimensions, um, the depth in, 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 in bits uh, of, of, you know, whether it's a color or black and white or grayscale thing, um, if there's any border defined for it, an origin where it, where it starts, you know, those are the typical things you will find for a window. Um, and then the state variables. Um, the state variables are uh, defining what state the window is currently in. For example, um, you may have a window that is currently not visible. You, so the application has it prepared, but it's currently asking this window not to be shown on the screen. That's often done if preparing the window content is fairly expensive and takes a long time and you don't want the user watching this, um, but you want it to be ready to go and then when the user when the time comes and, and, and the window is needed, then it's being mapped to the screen and actually shown. So that's typically controlled through a Boolean state variable that says, you know, it's visible or not. Similarly, windows can be um, valid or invalid. The moment that, you know, a window gets partially destroyed by another window disappearing in front of it and revealing a part that was previously, you know, overwritten by that other window. Um, as we saw earlier on the example on the GL, that means that this window is now uh, dirty, some people call it, or uh, invalid, you know, um, or damaged, you know, those are all sort of negative words that are being associated with this. So it means that some work needs to be done to, to fix that window again, right? It's currently has, has a hole. And very occasionally, you might have actually seen these things when they don't quite go right, right? You might launch an app on your computer, and then you launch another, and, and then when you reveal a window, you might sometimes see that maybe just momentarily or maybe permanently, that window doesn't redraw itself, maybe because the application hangs and then you will see, oh, there's just white space beneath it that used to be content and it's not getting re refilled as it should be. That's, that's when you see the window system at work or rather, I guess not at work at that point because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, <coughs> uh, the operations that are typically possible on these base windows uh, are drawing in them, of course, so you can draw in a window. And what's important to understand here is that every window will create its own coordinate system, right? So let's assume you are an application and you want to draw a triangle. Um, then you will first ask for a window to put the triangle in. And then from then that moment on, your reference coordinate system is that window. You don't care whether that window is up here on the screen or down here on the screen, right? You don't care. You draw with re relation to the coordinate system of that window that you just got from the base window system. And so your top, your zero zero is always the top left of that window, right? You, you can't go beyond that and you don't need to know. You actually don't know whether you are in the bottom right or top left of your screen or where you are on the screen. You have no idea. There's no usually no way for you to find out because you shouldn't care, right? So you just draw into your window, you got, you got your happy little own coordinate system that you can work with. Um, and that's what the base window system provides you with. And then of course it provides operations to, to change that state that we just talked about, like making it invisible or making it uh, invalid, stuff like this. There's often also one other bit that I didn't mention uh, many windows uh, will be either back, uh, active or non-active, right? And this is often means that are they the frontmost window that is currently receiving input, or are they in the back and being, um, you know, pushed to, towards the back layer and being covered by something else, even partially covered by something else that is the frontmost window. So be, knowing whether a window is active or not is also an important um, state variable, a Boolean state variable. Next up, we've got the events. So we already saw events on the on the level of the GL, and the uh, the base window system, of course, also has a, uh, an object available in its API that's called an event. Um, and as we just saw on the on the little graphic that that we looked at earlier, 
um, it will now contain an event type. Now, a mouse driver doesn't need to tell uh, in its driver that it's a mouse event because of, obviously it's a mouse event. The mouse driver doesn't create anything but mouse events. But now we actually have an event type <clears throat> that will tell me, oh, this is a mouse event. This is a keyboard event. This is a you know something else, a touchpad event. It'll have a timestamp. In this case, you know, system wide, uh, standardized and, and and synchronized. Uh, and we'll have data that's specific to the type. You know, a mouse event will have um, information about the mouse buttons being up and down, whereas a keyboard uh, event will have information about uh, one of uh, hundreds of keys being pressed or more. Um, then it oftentimes contains a location, and this is maybe weird, but oftentimes even other events that are not mouse events will still report the location of the mouse when that event happened. Uh, and that is to enable some things like hovering over a, um, a, a certain uh, window and then pressing a key. If I can then find out that this key press happened while the mouse was over that window, I can, for example, pipe that key press directly into that window. Some systems work that way. You can actually change focus of windows just by hovering over them. Maybe if you're a Unix user or a Linux user, you've seen that behavior and some, some window managers uh, even support this to this day. We'll show you some, some examples once we get to these systems. Um, an event will ultimately also have to be associated with a window. And that is part of the task that the window system does. It'll find out what window is supposed to receive this event. And through knowing which window was being hit with, an, for example, a mouse click, uh, we will also know uh, what application uh, that event is supposed to go to. Now, if I press a key uh, and I already have an active window, um, you know, let's say you are typing in, in your you're typing on your keyboard and you've got an active word a document open, then the the document window will have an area that is the typing area that is in in the end sort of a base level window, uh, and that area that you're typing a text in will currently be active and be, will be receiving input. So it will get read that keyboard press, uh, even though the keyboard itself may the, the keyboard event may not be associated in any way with that location. Right? In modern systems, you don't need to have your mouse hovering over that window to, to pipe input there. You just need to click it once, make it the active document window, and then that's where stuff goes, right? Um, we can, of course, the base window system will provide us with events, uh, with, with functions to read events, right? To read events from this global queue that it needs to build, um, to filter by certain types, maybe. Uh, maybe uh, an application says, I can stop listening to keyboard events, um, and then it will filter these correspondingly. And we already saw in Sebastian's little demo that it also allows writing events. So we can inject new events into the system as if they had been created by somebody else. Now, um, this is the state that we were at, right? This is what the GL gave us, um, the canonicalized but still separate event queues and we're now going to turn this into one queue and then distribute it again. So here's how we first merge these things. Um, merging or multiplexing means that we uh, take a look at each of these queues uh, and then we need to pull the events out and put them in order. Um, now, just as a question, can you think of a of a decent way of a decent algorithm to do that? Let's say I give you access to the mouse, keyboard, and trackpad queue, uh, and you're supposed, and they each contain a bunch of events piled up. They are locally sorted, right, inside their queues. So the newest event in each queue is at the top, uh, or I shouldn't say newest. I should say the oldest, right, the one that's been around the longest. That's the one that we need to handle next, right? Um, and you now have to put all these three queues and sort them into a single one. It's a, it's a simple algorithm, really. Uh, what, how would you do that? Great. So um, as you said, the events are ordered locally in each list. So you can just check which of these three events is the first one, because these are only three. So it would not be computationally hard to compare. And then you just mm -hmm. take the first one, um, compute it, 
take it out of the queue and then do the same thing again. So always check the first three ones and take the one which is the um, oldest one. So the one that happened the first, so the one which you need to uh, work with. Yep, absolutely. That's that's correct. Thank you. Um, so this is how we get to a single you know merged uh, list. This is it's, it's a very simple procedure, but I just wanted you guys to 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 realize this. And now we have one long list of events, right? Um, what we now need to do is we need to figure out where do these events belong, right? Because all we have is a mouse click, right? At position whatever, 100, 80. What does that mean? For this, we need to find out what is the application this belongs to and what is the window of that application, base window in this case, base window um, that this belongs to. And once we understand this, we then by going through, you know, understanding which window was being hit and what what application owns that window, we then know that we can tell this or this or this application about that event, so we can pipe it to that event application only. So that's what we call demultiplexing, right? Then we we spread out the events again uh, and send each event only to one application, which is supposed to be the recipient for of that event. And this can be tricky, right? For example, if I send an event to uh, if somebody clicks, um, has a has a front has an, an, an application open and active and frontmost, uh, it's a graphics application, right? And I click into that uh, uh, window, and maybe I'm drawing. I have a drawing tool selected. Then it's it's a clear thing, right? The click went inside that window. Uh, the window belongs to the draw. Uh, it's a base window. It's a drawing canvas that belongs uh, to a document window that is part of the the Photoshop app. So uh, I'm going to send that event to the Photoshop app and tell it, hey, your uh, document window got a hit in its drawing window right here. Uh, we have a click. So probably Photoshop, you probably want to have the this pixel that the user clicked at colored or whatever the drawing command was that the user had selected. But if that Photoshop window was at the back, so it was a non-active window, right? So you're currently working in your mail client and you click into the Photoshop window just to bring it to the front, as we say, right? Then that first click doesn't and shouldn't go to Photoshop to start drawing, right? It should say, well, you hit the Photoshop window, but it wasn't active. So instead, what you need to actually do is tell the window manager, hey, window manager, Photoshop needs to come to the foreground, please do your magic, you know, redecorate the window, try to change the title bar so that it now looks like a frontmost window rather than a, a, a back window. Um, redraw, tell other windows to redraw themselves if the Photoshop window by coming to the front covers or uncovers certain areas. Um, it will, usually it will, you know, it will start covering new areas. So we got lots of stuff going on, but um, Photoshop actually, may not even hear about that, right? It, all it might hear is maybe you're now the frontmost window. And then there may be things that Photoshop wants to do, but you know, by, by having the information, but it's not gonna do the drawing command that it normally would do. So this is a tricky business, right? Um, and as we, as we said earlier on, um, the base window system, for example, can also insert new events into this whole business, right? It can insert events itself uh, based on window states. For example, if we do what we just said, we bring, um, you know, the, the Photoshop window comes to the front, then one of the things that is probably gonna need to happen is that, uh, you know, the Photoshop window was previously maybe half covered behind a, a different one, and now it comes to the front. So now this part here that got uncovered needs to be redrawn. So what needs to happen is that the base window system injects a new event into the queue that says, dear Photoshop window, please, redraw this part of your interface. And this has, by the way, this concerns the following base windows that are overlapping this uh, dirty area that we need, now need to be redrawn, have redrawn, right? Um, it could even, uh, the base window system could even uh, implement certain input patterns. Like let's say you want your system to support a double click. Well, what's a double click? A double click is not a God-given thing, right? It's just two clicks happening in rapid sequence after each other. And some window systems even let you adjust what that distance between these two double clicks you know, needs to be for it to mean a double click rather than two single clicks. 
So the base window system could go in and could look at the event queue and say, I got a click. Let me see if another click comes in within a certain deadline. And if that is the case, then I will remove both single clicks from the queue and we will replace them instead with a double click event that I will send on to the corresponding application. So, you know, on the Mac, it's the Finder, on, on Windows, it's, it's the Windows Explorer, or whatever you call it. Um, and if a double click happens to be executed on, on, let's say, a file folder, then what that means is that it needs to be opened right, rather than just being selected. So these kinds of things will maybe require injecting events into the, into the stream. Um, next up, we have, uh, you know, the other objects that are available in the base window system are graphics contexts. Graphics contexts are around just in the GL, but here's the difference. I said earlier on that um, the GL has one graphics context, right? It, it doesn't have more than that. It can only hold one graphics context. So the GL has one graphics context. It's one, if you like, you know, one, one notepad that it can fill in with what's my drawing color, what's my, you know, line width, what's my font, et cetera. But we said that the base window system is responsible for making every app feel like you know it owns the universe, right? It's it has everything at its disposal. So that's why, for example, the uh, base window system will have many graphics contexts. Um, what that means is that, for example, let's say you have two applications. You've got Photoshop and you got you know Word running. And Photoshop now, and they're both rendering, right? They're both busy drawing stuff. Maybe Word is busy, you know, filling in a page of uh, text that you just scroll to, while Photoshop is busy, you know, loading a picture from disk and, and rendering this. So they're busy drawing stuff. And they're doing this quasi parallel, right? Um, so what will happen is that Photoshop will say, I need to draw these. Uh, I need to draw these things and uh, maybe draw some text or something. Um, and it will have its own graphics context that says, my text is currently read and um, using Helvetica, right? Um, and it will send these commands. It will have its own graphics context. And when it, it's, it's turned to draw a little bit, it will take that context and download it into the GL and replace the current context in the GL with its, its own context, right? So it will overwrite what the GL had previously and will say, this is now your setting. And then it will send its 100 graphic drawing commands, all text uh, that's all gets rendered in red and in Helvetica 12 point. Then, you know, Word gets a slice of time in the multiplexing nature that is, you know, modern multitasking and says, I got a bunch of things to draw. So GL, my graphics context currently says that we're drawing in black with, you know, uh, Times Roman in 14 point. And I have some text to output. So it will have its own graphics context with its own settings that will stick around. Uh, and it will download that into the GL. The other context from Photoshop gets replaced. And now the GL will render this all the text that it gets from Word uh, with you know, this different color and different font. Um, so every time a new application gets you know, to be uh, active, it will then overload the graphics context uh, uh, in the GL with its own graphics context. Uh, apart from that, the, the attributes are, are similar to the ones that we've already seen, right? Could be text attributes um, like the skew or the color of text or direction that's rendered right, right to left or left to right, um, or whether the text is supposed to be copied onto the surface or whether it's supposed to be XORed in to create this you know, cool inversion uh, effect. Um, or whether it's supposed to be merged with the background pixels so that it, it adds to the pixels. There are different bit uh, logical bit operations that you can do on, on when you render text onto a background. Um, and same is true, of course, for, for graphics drawings like lines or, or, or circles or arcs and stuff like this. That's why we have these things also in the graphics attributes um, and not just the text attributes. Um, a graphics context will also contain a reference to a color table. Uh, and what that means, we'll talk about in, on the next slide, uh, a color table is basically there to um, enable drawing when you don't do every single drawing command or every, you know, when your drawing commands aren't all in true color. Like if not every drawing command uses a 24-bit, let's say, for example, or even maybe 30-bit um, 
uh, vector of, of RGB colors. Uh, this is often true when we try to save space. For example, um, you can have um, a, a screen memory that takes up three full bytes for every pixel, but that's very you know, comparably expensive, right? Uh, it's a lot of space. Um, I could say, hey, I'm just going to use one byte per pixel, but I'm still going to let you draw all kinds of colors into that screen. Um, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to tell you, you can set each byte of uh, each pixel to a byte value. So anything between one and 255 or zero and 255. So we got 256 different values. And each of these values is not going to be a color uh, definition, but it's actually going to be a pointer to a table. It's going to tell me it's an index into a table. And that table is going to contain the actual color value. So color zero might be black. Color one might be a bright red. Color two might be a, you know, a, a, a pink. Color four might be a, you know, a, a dark green, whatever. Each of these colors in the color table is defined with full three bytes of, of color resolution. right? Um, so I can create on my screen any color from the uh, full 24-bit color range that I have available. But at any time, I can only have, let's say we are using one byte for a pixel, I can only have 256 different colors at the same time on my screen. You know, a moment later, I can change my color table and I can show 256 other values on the screen. That's OK. But at any time, in, in, at the same moment, I can only show a limited number of colors. A lot of application developers probably say, well, that's good enough for me. I'm glad that I can pick any color I want, and, but I'm fine. I don't need more than 256 at the same time. right? Uh, and so that's a very common uh, scheme that you'll see when uh, memory is a bit of you know, a scarce resource, then oftentimes images will have color tables. It's also a frequent thing that you see in, in storing images, right? Image, images that are stored in files, um, you know, GIF or whatever, uh, will often also use that trick of a color table. So they only need to have a color table once, and then you know all the pixels are just referencing that color table. And that's way, way uh, more memory uh, efficient than storing the full RGB value for every single pixel, because more than likely, you don't have that many different colors in your, in your image. Different story about, of course, when you get to JPEGs and photorealistic images, there you tend to have lots of different colors and color tables start to make a little bit less of, of a sense. But with diagrams or, or, or these kind of icons, you know, color tables are a great way to save lots of memory. So a color table will have an owner. Many, many people can share the same color table as users. They will have data fields for every color entry. And I always talk about RGB because that's the one that we are all you know, comfortable with and know and understand directly how it works. But there are other color models, right? There's the HSV model uh, for hue, saturation, and value. Um, and there are YIQ models. So there are lots of different way ways to uh, describe color with, with certain numbers. Um, uh, you can see many of these if you go into a graphics application and switch to different color modes. Um, they will typically support these different color fields, and you can play with them. Um, the operations in color tables are oftentimes um, uh, that they will provide a default color. So if I don't specify any color, then uh, they will give me a default. And um, a good color table um, system uh, inside the base window system will also give me close matches. If I say, um, oh, I have a, a full color uh, data here in memory, and I now need to render this into this on-screen area, but the on-screen area is using a color table, then um, there should usually be an algorithm that um, that maps to the closest color in the table from a from an eight you know from a twenty four bit value, for example. So this makes them a bit fault tolerant, right? They will say, "I can I can live with it if you ask me for a color that isn't actually currently in the table. I can give you a close approximation if the color table is already full." Um, sometimes this is also done via dithering, right? So you might say, "I need you know a, I need an orange tone, but the color table only contains yellow and and and, and red." And it say it can say, "Well, I can give you orange if you're willing to sacrifice pixel resolution. I can give you red, yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow in a checkerboard pattern. It'll look kind of orange to the eye because the eye tends to 
merge these colors together, especially if the resolution of pixels is very high. And that's called dithering. Um, another thing that's in the base window system is, for example, a fonts, right? Fonts uh, will reappear in the base window system with an owner and a user. Uh, uh, the name of the font, certain measurements like the font size. Uh, what's the kerning? Kerning means the distance between uh, individual letters. It's not the same for every uh, letter pair. It differs based on how the letters are um, are looking. We talked about this in DIS1 briefly. Ligatures, like what we see here, the F and the L here are actually not two separate characters, but they were one thing. So FL in sequence, um, good font rendering engines provide you with uh, ligatures that are easier to read on the eye than uh, rendering these separately. Um, and then, of course, the font object has one data field per character in that, in that font. And um, typically, fonts are shared as read-only. So even the owner is just, a, just another read-only user. Um, and uh, fonts are increasingly offered these days uh, by the graphics event library or, or even lower layers for performance reasons. Uh, the base window system usually these days doesn't actually do the rendering. Um, but they're often still managed on the level of the base window system. In macOS, for example, um, even NSString, which is an extremely basic class for strings, um, actually provides font uh, capabilities and can do, can do this kind of rendering. So you tell a string to render itself. You don't uh, um, do the rendering in the base window system. All right, there's one more little brain teaser that I want to do with you guys before we wrap up for today. And that is, how do we find out uh, what window is supposed to get a certain event? And for that, we need to manage the base windows that are being created by various applications in some kind of data structure. What we use for this typically um, is a tree, right? So here I'm showing you a very simple example of a tree uh, with a root and a couple children. Um, and the following rules are typically used to manage base window, uh, base window system windows, the ones that we call base windows, uh, to manage them in the tree. The first rule is if a window is a child of another one, it means that it is geometrically contained in it. So I have, let's say, a, a Word document window, which consists of tons of base windows, or let's say a dialog box, maybe that's simpler. And the dialog box contains three buttons, you know, OK, cancel, help. Uh, these three buttons will be children of that dialog box window uh, because they are geometrically contained in it and they belong to it. Uh, this ordering um, of children being contained uh, of, of, of children being contained inside their parent tremendously simplifies the routing of events and, and setting of visibility. If I want to, for example, remove a, um, a window, uh, then I just need to make sure that I clear out the entire area of the dialog. I don't need to worry about any children of it hanging off and outside that, that window, right? Uh, because I know that the window covers the entire space that it, that, it, that it needs, including all its children. The other rule that you need to remember is that in a window system, we may have things overlapping each other, right? We may have, um, I'm gonna use my professional windows here again. I might have one window here, uh, and then there may be another window that's partly overlapping this, right? So I need to know which one is in front of which one, right? There's a, there's a Z ordering to windows. It's discrete, it's not continuous. I don't care how much the distance is here. I just need to know an order, right? Who comes first? And, and that's important because if I click now and I click in the area where these two overlap, it needs to go to the brown window, not to the yellow one, obviously, right? Because that's in the front. Uh, also, when I draw them, I need to draw this one first, and then I need to draw this one so that the yellow one gets covered by the brown one, not the other way around, right? That would be a different ordering. Um, so our ordering will be back to front, right? So the first item in the queue will be the backmost window, uh, the first sibling in, in this tree. Other siblings on that same level of the tree uh, will be uh, will be behind it. So this means that here, sorry, in front of it. So this will be the backmost window, and this one will be further in front in this sim simple example here. Let's take it an ex actual example. This is, a, this is an in-class exercise for you guys to think about. Uh, you'll need a pencil and a piece of paper to do this. Um, so think about this. You, let's assume you're seeing this arrangement. Uh, so let's call uh, window number one. These are all base window system windows, so simple rectangular areas on the screen. And base window system window number one, base window one, 
uh, we could call maybe the desktop, right? Um, so I want you to draw a valid tree structure for what you are seeing here. There is more than one answer to this because we're not telling you everything you need to know to decide the one exact tree structure. So currently, there's more than one possibility to, to interpret this picture. Uh, but I want you to draw one valid tree structure that could represent this window arrangement that you see that you see above. Uh, yes, I found uh, the first one, so the uh, window one, mm -hmm. as the uh, the parent, so the only mm -hmm. root that we have, mm -hmm. and then uh, three children as two, three, and four. Two, three, and four. Okay. And for two, we have two children as five and six. And for three, we have only one children as seven. Okay, so I agree with the child seven of three because that could be a button like inside a dialogue but there's one thing that is a little tricky in your in your interpretation if we look at window six there's actually two things that we need to bring up but one is this window number six you said this could be a, a, a child of window number two now this is it's true that it is geometrically contained in it but there's one thing that means that this can't be right do you see what the problem with six is as being a child of number two? Imagining because, it to be, yeah? Because it's also on the tree, so. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That means, imagine this to be a button in a dialogue. It's impossible for another window to wedge behind the button, right? Uh, between the button and its, and, its, and its dialogue window. So it has to be uh, its own child window, right? Um, so that's why uh, you are very close. There was one other thing that I wanted to uh, to bring up, and that was the order of the first level children. Um, maybe, um, how about we got a couple more hands up here. Um, Leah, do you want to uh, say something about the, uh, the order of the windows on the first level? In that case, I would put uh, two first, then four, then three, then six, because that's how they're ordered from back to front. Oh, did exactly. I get the direction one? Yeah. yeah, that's that's exactly right. So uh, in combination, that gives us the right solution. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm cheating. I got this pre-painted here. Um, this is uh, the uh, the sort of you know suggested ordering here. We got the 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 desktop sort of thing, you know, the root of this entire tree here as one, and then we got two, uh, which is the backmost one because it is covered by three. So three needs to come after two. Uh, then here's four. Four and two could actually change places. That would be possible because they're not overlapping each other. So we don't have an, we don't know about a back to front ordering here. In the end, there is going to be some back to front ordering, but it's not apparent here, right? So four and two could trade places. Uh, but three needs to come after that because it's further to the front. And six needs to come even after that because it is even in front of three. Um, and then seven and uh, five can be. Um, ordinary children of their respective parents, but six cannot, as we just discussed. But that's not the only valuable, uh, valid interpretation. Could somebody suggest another interpretation, uh, a different uh, tree that would also work? Yeah, sure. Uh, for example, what we could say is that uh, these windows inside the desktop, the number one, they don't have children at all. So they're all on the same level, they're all siblings. So then we have to uh, take in consideration, okay, so two and four are, let's say, doesn't matter the, the order, mm -hmm. of course. Three has to be above, so it's later. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, five and seven have to be above two and three, so they have to be later in this order. Uh, but six has, has to also be above two and three. However, we cannot say about five, six, and seven how they are, uh, how they say, in the, what's the Z order order between the three of them because we don't see whether they overlap or not. Yeah, yeah. I would actually or, argue that even I mean here's here's an example of what, what you just said. I would yeah, argue that exactly. even five and three, uh, we don't really know which order they come in, right? They they could also be uh in, in any any order. Uh so yeah, but that's correct. So this is another interpretation that would be possible if this was lots of applications running, lots, 
of individual applications running all popping up their own single base window system interfaces. Very unlikely because usually uh, even a single document window or, or dialogue is made up of lots of base windows, but it's possible. Um, okay. And so why this is interesting is if you now imagine you want to identify the click target, right? Let's say you get a click uh, with the mouse, uh, you know, being above window seven, right? Uh, so it's 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 right here, right? What we would do then is the event would enter the tree at the root node. It would enter the tree at root num uh, node number one. It would say, well, for sure, you know, that that window got hit because it's the entire desktop, right? Um, and then every child would be asked whether the event is inside it, um, and that happens um, in this case you know, would have to happen front to back because we're not, we're interested in the frontmost window that says this event happened inside me. So in this case, we'd have to start from the right um, and say, hey, uh, window six, did you get hit? Now, uh, window three, did you get hit? Well, yes, I did, right? That's the first one that comes. And then we would say, okay, window three says yes. So the thing get, starts recursively. We would say inside window three, are there any children that are inside uh, three that also got hit by this event that also were overlapping. And again, if there would be multiple ones, we would do the overlapping thing. In this case, we only have one child, that's seven. And seven also says, hey, I got hit, right? So, and since seven doesn't have any further children, we now know that the event was meant to go to child, uh, to, to base window seven. Now, this is where the event will go. And this would, if this was the okay button inside dialog box three, right? then that's exactly where we want it to be. What could happen though, is that window seven is a child of, of three, but it is actually, uh, let's say just a, um, an icon that doesn't actually re respond to click events, um, but the whole dialog box three here does respond to click events. And it will say, when I get clicked on, I disappear. Maybe it's, you know, the whole dialog box waits for a click to go away. And the icon doesn't have anything to do. So in this case, once Windows 7 has been told that, hey, you got clicked on, Windows 7 could also say, well, that's nice and all, but I don't really know what to do with this. And then the event would actually travel back up the chain, right? It would go back to three and say, hey, seven didn't know anything to do with it. So seven now will tell three, do you know what this click meant? And if three doesn't know what to do with it, it would actually go back to the desktop, right? Uh, so that's a possibility, but maybe, you know, it was a right click and no, nobody can do anything with it except the desktop because it's a system wide function to, I don't know, pop up a context menu or whatever, right? Uh, and so the event is not lost in that child, it needs to travel back. We'll see a lot of this going up and down trees when we work with, with Windows system hierarchies. All right, just to wrap this up, uh, we got a couple shared resources in the base window system. Um, we share them, of course, because they are scarce or we need to collaborate on them. And there are, of course, issues with this, like, you know, we may compete for them uh, or maybe have things like um, uh, consistency issues. How do we solve this? Well, we do need some kind of synchronization, right? Uh, and the synchronization happens, and this is really stuff that you will probably know from your operating system uh, classes, like um, between system and stuff. Um, you can synchronize um, at the entrance of the base window system. So whenever any code enters the base window system, you create um, you know, a monitor, a block basically, and the, the code runs in the base window system and only one application can be executing code inside the entire base window system at one point. That's possible. It's pretty expensive. It's pretty blocking, right? So stuff might quickly slow down. If, um, if lots of applications need to do stuff on the base window system level, and you're blocking everything only because I'm accessing this one resource, you're shutting down the all access to the base window system, not very efficient. You can get finer grained synchronization by synchronizing on individual objects. So any code is allowed to enter the base window system and do stuff like call base window system functions. But the moment, for example, we access, let's say an object, uh, we can make that object, like a, maybe it's a window uh, data structure or a color table data structure. We can make that object uh, uh, entrance controlled. We put a monitor, like you know, a flag basically at the beginning that says, am I currently in use? And, and when the first piece of code enters it, it flips that flag. 
And then while it's running, if other code comes in and wants to change that, also use that code and that data structure, it can't because the object is currently busy, right? It's currently being occupied. Uh, so these are monitors uh, that you probably know from base window systems um, as, as, a, as a standard construct to manage um, concurrent access. Um, this, of course, if you do it on individual objects, is much more fine-grained, it's faster, but it introduces more complexity and overhead, so it can it can also be slower. It depends really on your on your use case and on your communication patterns. How do we put the base window system into the operating system? Well, we can put it all into one single address space. This is very simple to implement. It doesn't need any synchronization. Um, you don't have any concept of a process in this case, um, and you control uh, you hand control over collaboratively, meaning that. Uh, one application needs to explicitly give up the processor and call another application. The next one in round line, there's sort of a round robin theme of apps passing control to each other. Early systems like Mac OS Classic or Xerox Star or even Windows uh, 3.x worked like this. The reason for that is, you know, this is the reason why these systems were really good at crashing phenomenally, right? Because one application hanging means that it's never going to do that call to let the next application have its share of the cake. And so one crashing application can bring the whole system down. Uh, we don't do things this way anymore. Um, uh, so we nowadays have uh, preliminary, you know, we have preliminary, multi uh, sorry, uh, preemptive multitasking that just pushes applications off the processor. But uh, another way to handle this is with kernel and address space splits. So the base window system uh, th what this means is, you know, you got parts of your Windows system in the kernel alongside the OS kernel, like the Linux kernel, for example, and other parts are running on user as user level processes, things that you can just fill and and rerun and nobody cares, right? Uh, that's a typical structure. Um, you see this, for example, in the X Windows system. Um, applications are individual processes running in user ad address space. The base Windows system and the graphics event library um, are part of the system uh, address space. And each base window system um, a runtime library call is basically then a kernel entry. That means that it's expensive. Entering the kernel is always expensive as a call, but it also means that you're doing it with kernel priorities. So it, once you're in there, you're really fast handling stuff because nobody else can hold you, uh, hold you down. And communication is then often done um, via our shared memory uh, processes that, that allow you to handle the uh, synchronization via the kernel. You know, because if I only can enter the kernel one at a time, that's usually the case for kernels, uh, then you know, synchronization happens automatically. You get it for free, basically. Um, so that's another way to do this. You could also you know, keep the base window system in user address space and just put the GL into the kernel. Um, then you know, these uh, transitions from base window system to, to graphics event like, become more expensive because you're entering the kernel. Um, but you've moved the base window system out of the kernel, so um, it's a little less likely to lead to phenomenal crashes because you've got less code running in the, in the kernel mode. Uh, there can, you know, this basically makes the base window system a user process, right? Uh, the base window system loses the privileges and uh, it's just a user level server uh, running in user space uh, for client applications that also run in user space. You communicate via inter-process communication, IPC. Um, um, the way that you then do parallelism depends on, on your, how you program your base window system. You can make it a, a single thread a server, so it only takes one request at a time uh, and synchronizes when you enter it. Um, or you can make it uh, have its own multi-threading capability so it can handle several requests at the same time and then um, have shared objects in the base window system that are protected using monitors. Or you can even have a multi-service architecture, right? Several separate servers for different tasks, a font server, a speech recognition server, a speech synthesis server, and so on. This is often done in, in systems like X, where you have dedicated servers for different tasks. Um, what I what I wanted want you to understand is that when you move the base window system in the user level, then you get a lot of flexibility because it means uh, that you can replace it, right? You can, it, it is a normal user level process that the user can start, relaunch, and, and things like that. And that is the case oftentimes when the window system is put on top of an existing um, uh, textual uh, base OS, like in the case of Linux and X. 
that's wrap, that wraps it up. The basement system works with these device and operating system independent abstractions, right? It only makes very general assumptions about the OS at this time. Uh, it supports uh, the security and consistency inside a system by encapsulating things and synchronizing access. Um, it maps basically, I like to think of it as you could call it the princess principle, right? Uh, or you know maybe the prince slash princess principle. The idea is that all the applications are little princesses. They have their own kingdom. They can say, um, I'm going to draw to my window, and I'm sure I can do this. I'm not going to care about any access issues. I'm going to draw to anything that I have access to, and I, it's going to be fine. That's my whole world that I draw into. Uh, and the next you know princess over there in, in, in her own kingdom will do the same thing. I've got my own kingdom, you know, drawing to things. Uh, similarly. Uh, you know, an event coming in, you know, the prince, princess can say, I'm sure that's my event. I'm sure it's meant for me. Of course, if anybody mentions an event, it must be about me, uh, right? And it will handle the event. And they're all fine, right? Because they're all living in their little bubbles that the base window system creates for them by carefully routing the right events to the right application. So nobody sees things that are not meant for their ears. And on the output side, taking outputs and organizing, synchronizing, clipping, et cetera, them so that nobody accesses stuff that they're not supposed to be accessing. So in a way, you could say, what does a base window system do? It takes many different applications with lots of different resources, base windows, but also other resources. And it maps all this to one underlying system you know, of hardware and OS. You could actually start writing complete GUI apps with just the GEL in the base window system. Sounds crazy, but you could build, you could rewrite Microsoft Word only with these things. It would be a terrible amount of work, but you could. Uh, what are we still missing? Well, we're still missing buttons, scroll bars, menus, icons, you know, all that stuff doesn't exist yet, right? We have no decoration around our windows. We have no close buttons around them yet. We have no way for the user to move a window around. That doesn't exist yet. All these things will come in the next two layers, window manager and UITK. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.